whatever. Uh, I just think that that helps to humanize the meeting. It helps make it so it's not, doesn't feel like a waste of time when, when the meeting actually starts five or 10 minutes later. And so I'm starting to think that that's just a, for now, a best practice. So w welcome to everyone. Uh, we appreciate you coming. And we wanted, you know, one of the things that these meetings do for me, and I think that I'm not the only one, but I'll just speak for myself since that's what I know, is that I, I know that I spend too much time looking at my news app, you know, and I know that I spend too much time being anxious about the future and seeing what's going on in the news and thinking the entire world is crazy. And then I come to these gatherings and we have a discussion, we get to talk about things with other real people. It's not the CNN Fox matrix. And uh, that to me is just incredibly, incredibly valuable and incredibly important. And so one of the things that we do in this space is we want it to be a safe space. We want to be able to talk about things. We want to be able to disagree pleasantly, but be able to disagree if we don't actually think hard enough that we once in a while disagree, then I don't think we're accomplishing much in this space. And I feel like there are other spaces out there that are much more dangerous to speak freely in. So this is a safe space for conversation with the intent of forwarding everyone on the calls, action and understanding and ability to deal with the, what feels like just ongoing changes that we're all being buffeted by. And one of the biggest things that we've talked about on these calls and probably that you've talked about in your personal conversations like I have is this whole idea of what just happened, what is happening and what is, what is it going to look like going forward? So uh, we tried to bring together some different representative views. You'll see that as we get going. Um, and we, you know, there are a few things that I think are, are important for us to think about here as, as an overarching, some overarching themes. One is what's happening with the economy. Cause I've started to kind of think of the whole thing just in economic terms, just to make it really simple. What's the best way to go back to work? What's the best way to open up business? What are the things that we have to do no matter how people might feel politically or not, what's going to actually get us rolling again and what's going to serve us all best as just collective humanity here. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting is that in places where they're going back more, uh, things like uh, places like Europe and China, I'm hearing from people that I talk with there that people are forgetting the promises they made about how little they wanted to drive and how little they wanted to travel. So what are some of the things that we can learn out of this that we want to keep? What are some things that might make the, the world or our lives personally better as we go forward? And then, you know, what can we talk about in this space, in this time that we've carved out that's going to make a difference for us as we continue to pursue our lives and go forward into this very uncertain looking future. And with that, I'll hand it over to my good friend by now, Dana Long. And, um, and Dana is gonna, Dana's gonna take us in. Here, here we go. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that, John. Actually, uh, Tino, or I thought you wanted to run through the slides or I'm happy to if you'd like me to. Okay, uh, I will. You can do it. <laughs> Okay, very good. Well, in the context that we've discussed before, um, we've talked about the three R's, react, reset, and renew. And today we're really at the stage where we, where we are resetting and getting ready for the renew. So as John said, you know, what's the future looking? What, what do we want to, what's the, the better new normal rather than just the old ways? So that's where we want to focus the conversation today. So we'll spend about 45 minutes or so. Um, we are honored to have three distinct panelists with us today. Um, I'll introduce them in a moment. And during, okay, we'll do that now. <laughs> then after the panel discussion, we'll do a short Q&A. Then we'll break into three subgroups based on what you signed up for. Then we'll come back and have a group sharing of what you learned in the subgroup. 
So first to introduce myself, I'm Dana Long. I'm a professional business coach um, specializing really in change management and transformation. I've worked uh, for corporations for the last 30 years and have home office for the last 12. So hopefully I can bring some perspective to both the corporate world and the home office world of uh, now being a solo entrepreneur. Also with us, um, so I'll be your host today asking the questions, but the main feature are our three panelists. We have Denny Boyles, who is the Assistant Director of HR at the Orlando Magic NBA team. Ooh. Uh, Denny is the Assistant Director of Talent Acquisition and Development for the Orlando Magic and their partner organizations. With over 20 years of recruitment experience in corporate environments and a current role in overseeing employee development, um, Denny will help us explore the future going back to the work in a large traditional company. Very excited to hear that one. Next we have uh, Carrie Chattison, is the principal of a creative director for CCS, a branding and design agency working with large nonprofit and innovative companies, including ACLU, American Express, MIT, and the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention. With studios based in New York City, Rhode Island, and a wide network of collaborators, Carrie will help us explore the challenges and benefits of going remote work for creative firms. And lastly, we have Tony Shartner, who is the Executive Director of the Venture Cafe and Esther Call Providence. Tooney leads the Rhode Island uh, team in creating an inclusive, strong, supportive, and accessible innovation community with a background in community initiatives, economic development, and a co-working space of management. Tooney offers a wealth of wisdom and experience to solo entrepreneurs considering the future of work. So with that said, um, you'll notice our speakers all have this fancy schmancy future look background, so they're easily identifiable. Um, I will go around and ask each of our panelists, oh hi, hey Amy, little girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, ask each panelist uh, a series of questions. We have four questions, and uh, feel free to type questions into the chat. We'll have a formal Q and A after they've answered the four questions. But um, feel free to along the way. You know, uh, this is a fairly small, intimate group, so feel free to ask what you want to ask. So we'll start with the first question, and we'll start with Tooney, who is the recipient of uh, our donations today. So if there's anything to add, um, Tooney, on your introduction, please feel free to. My first question to the panelists is, how did you run your business prior to COVID? Well, we didn't have any virtual programming prior to COVID. And thank you, Tino, and thank you, Dana and Mike, for inviting me, first and foremost, to this panel. I'm very excited about this conversation. I'm kind of obsessed with this topic. Uh, having co-founded the Hive RI, the Southern Rhode Island's first co-working space, which is the nucleus of a whole mill community, and then being the inaugural director of Innovate Newport, and now um, working with this amazing team at District Hall Venture Cafe Providence. So um, prior to this, we, I had just started as executive director in January and <laughs> thought we were in good shape in Q1, getting ready to you know, reorganize the org structure and you know, solidify our strategic plan for the rest of 2020. And then of course the world turned upside down. Um, but to directly answer your question, um, everything was different, right? So we had projected, um, the majority of our revenue coming from meeting room and event space rentals. Uh, that's a big uh, part of what we do at District Hall. And then our Venture Cafe programming was only Thursdays. So now we've hosted 70 virtual programs in less than four months with over 3,000 attendees. And we're getting ready to open up our virtual space. So kind of everything is different and some things will remain the same and um, complete with Completely uh, with you, John. I'm very fearful that we'll um, lose sight of some of the major lessons we've learned from this process. So, great. Thank you, Tooney. Let's move over to Carrie. Tell me a little bit about how your business was run prior to the pandemic. Uh, sure. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, guys. Um, so, uh, prior to moving to Rhode Island, I worked in New York City for 16 years. Um, and we relocated the business to Rhode Island in 2014. Um, ironically, prior to moving to Rhode Island, <clears throat> I was pretty much working with a remote team of freelancers and, and strategic partners around the country. Um, but when I moved to Rhode Island, I made a conscious decision to build a team because I was missing that in-person creative collaboration. 
So for the last six years or so, there have been um, three of us, actually there were four, um, we lost one person because of COVID, um, oh. <clears throat> but we, there are three of us working full time in our studio, so we're pretty small, uh, along with occasional freelancers. Um, one of my designers has a long commute, so she was already working at home on Fridays. And we still work remotely with our strategic partners um, since many of them are out of state. So we were kind of set up to be able to work at the studio and from home or any locations traveling, if we were traveling or on a press check, things like that. Um, so most of our clients are still in New York City. So pre-COVID, uh, there was a lot of traveling back and forth, but thankfully I you know, st slowly started to train clients to, <sighs> Um, take virtual conferences to save us the trip in. Sometimes we would go in and have like just a two hour meeting and then have to come all the way back. So we've sort of trained them, which has helped in the long run. Uh, we don't have too many in-person meetings at our office um, since most of our clients are out of state. So that's also made things a little bit easier. Um, so now the question is, you know, how are we gonna work moving forward? And we have, we have a plan for that. Um, and though, although our core team works in the office, uh, we use all cloud-based software and tools. So we, we've been set up basically to work in any location. Right. Well, first, Carrie, I, I am uh, very sad to hear about the loss of one of your colleagues. It's, this is uh, hitting all of us very closely. So um, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Um, Denny, tell me about your workspace before all this fun. Yeah, for sure. So. Uh, I'll, I'll preface this with, you know, when you look at a, a sports franchise, whether it's the NBA or others, they're really kind of broken into two main channels. You've got the, the products on the court or the field or the ice or the whatever, and that's its kind of own entity. Um, and then you've got the business side of things. And so the business side is traditionally a, a sales and service model, right? You've got whatever that product is on the court or the ice, whatever that crazy circus everybody comes to see. Other than that, it's about corporate dollars, right? Your cor corporate sponsorships, right? When you go to a basketball game and they have the Southwest Airlines blimp dropping the coupons and, uh, hey, we hit three threes in a quarter. So um, Chick-fil-A, we've got that. So it's got the corporate dollars coming in. You've got fans coming into the arena or into the stadium. Um, so that's the sales aspect. And you've got the service model. Okay, we have them here. Now we need to have them have a great time to see the value and to come back. And so with the scope of kind of that being the focus of our business. Um, you know, we were, we're a sports franchise, so we're traditionally a little bit old school. If you look at our, our specific leadership, if you go to the Orlando Magic website, you'll see our executive team, they've all been there 24, 25 years out of the 31 in existence, which is a good thing. We have low turnover, but you also have a little bit of some mindset of, um, you know, we need to be in the office. If you're not in the office, you're not working kind of a deal, right? And so. Um, the some of the the practices we had were a little i would say outdated uh, i've come in and, and kind of pushed that as much as i can um in sports you don't work seven days a week part traditionally but your availability is seven days a week there's a game on a saturday game on a sunday you're working and it's 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 crazy and it's hectic so our our methods are very different than the traditional kind of nine to five monday to friday our games are at night so if it's a night game you're coming in at at 12 or so but you're staying till 11 or 12 at night so the rhythm is very different. So when we meet and how we meet is very, uh, very different. Um, and so I know we've got some other questions coming, but um, it's very, you know, we got to get into a meeting. We got to get together. Um, you, you, you piece it together when you can based on all the other schedules. And on a game day, it's a whole different kind of other animal. Like we have a no rule, uh, rule of no meetings because you're just running around the arena like a crazy, crazy, uh, crazy person and a crazy team. So even you from HR are, are you know, hands-on in the arena? I mean, mm -hmm. so wow. Somebody from, somebody from HR works every game, and it's more for, um, you know, workers' comp. Like, I worked at a game, and one of the dancers tore her Achilles at halftime. We had somebody get shot in the ear, one of our employees, with a little T-shirt cannon, like silly things like that. Like, it happens. And so we're filling out the, the paperwork, and we're, we're helping them get the, the help that they need. So we, we, we rotate it between the five of us, but somebody works – the, the entire uh, entire game. Wow. Yeah, and did you hear that ginormously huge organization you have, the five HR people for the entire <laughs> <laughs> Orlando Magic? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right, thank you, Denny. Um, 
Okay, so let's get to kind of more of the me, kind of t t describe for us the, the dark moment around the COVID where you realized that you really had to change, that life as you knew it had stopped and needs to, to revamp. Did we lose Toonie? Did I lose her? Oh, she just... oh, there you are, you under my... Uh... <laughs> I'm right here. I'm okay, Toonie, let's go back to you. <laughs> okay, um, well, because we're part of a global organization um, and connected though separate from CIC the founder of CIC Tim Rowe was very 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 early Cambridge um, Innovation Center yep sorry guys <laughs> me and, um, and because our you know there are 10 of 10 venture cafes globally Tokyo obviously got hit first and they closed early so we um, we had many 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 hours of very thoughtful conversations with our global counterparts all the executive directors, um, we logged many hours of Zoom calls um, that last week in February and first week in March. So our, our first virtual event was the first Thursday in March. Um, we were in our space and the people that we were featuring, the presenters were in our space. And then that Friday was the last day my team was in the space. And then we decided, I decided over the weekend that uh, we had to do our part to, um, to, um, geez, I can't even think of the terminology now. Um, flatten the curve. <laughs> flatten the curve, thank you. And, uh, you know, we were planning on leaving the, the, the public lounges because part of our job is front of that fancy building is to create that inclusive environment that, you know, innovation is for everyone is our tagline and we mean it. And we run the front of the house there and within the front of the house in that beautiful new building, we have two public lounges. So, um, so deciding to close that down was difficult for me as the director. Unfortunately, my boss is on here somewhere, Dan, um, who is head of Venture Cafe New England. And we just, we have, we have a very thoughtful um, leadership team and all of our teams are very thoughtful. And it, it took a lot of thought, um, but we saw what was coming because of our global counterparts. So it was that first week in March that we decided and the team was awesome and agile and pivoted hard and fast and just <laughs> have been along for the ride. We've been in the same boat, rowing in the same direction, and, um, and we did it. I, I, I guess we just knew what our, we know what our job is, and we just kept moving forward into it. We leaned in. Well, Tony, that's an interesting perspective, having um, a, a vantage point of a global perspective that you could really empathize with your you know, counterparts overseas. That's, that was uh, very thoughtful of your organization. <laughs> Well, it was Tokyo, Tokyo first, then Sydney, and then um, we decided in Providence and Boston, and and everyone kind of followed right right along that first and second week in March. Sure, sure, great. Thank you, Tuning. How about you, Carrie? Talk to me about in, from your perspective. Uh, it's interesting because I was thinking back. It was it was a blur. Like I don't even remember the day that we left. To be honest, like we were kind of in denial a little bit. Like, oh, we can we can work no problem we're small we can do this i was starting to get phone calls from clients in new york saying you know we're canceling our event um we're you know we have a spending freeze it was like total panic then the announcement of distance learning so i'm like oh my god my kids are going to be at home and i have to work at home um so it, there was just one day and i think it was on a monday we just came in and we said that's it. We're going to start working from home. We weren't prepared. It was, I literally left with my desktop computer, my paperwork supplies. I, I went to the liquor store. I remember that I've, I had food at home. So I went to the liquor store, stocked up and then went home and made a makeshift office in my guest room. And I just remember the unknowns being really scary. Like, am I going to have any business? Everyone's kind of canceling projects. And, and I was totally freaking out. Then I pulled it together um, and in a way, the slowdown was good for us in so many ways because it really gave us that time and space to function, uh, learn how to function, how we're going to function as a team and how we're going to stay in business and like rethink how we're going to do business um, moving forward um, and then trying to balance the distance learning as well. So I think we did okay, but it was definitely a blur. I just, you know, I remember like running to the bank and like, I need a line of credit. I need another credit card. I need like this total panic, um, ah. but it all worked out and we're okay. We're still in business. So while others were out getting toilet paper, I love that you were out getting liquor. You go girl. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Denny's, uh, from your perspective. 
Yeah. So for us, it was, um, it was very unique. We're playing our games. We're going through our business. We're watching what's happening in the world. And then I know I'll never forget. Um, I'm at home. It's, it's Wednesday, March 11th. And I think we've all seen it now. If you follow sports, you see Mark Cuban get the text from the league as he's courtside watching the Magic's game. And then it kind of starts to spread out like, okay, the NBA's just postponed their season. So at that point, it's about 1030 or so. My phone starts blowing up from my friends, from my coworkers, from our leadership. Hey, our season's now on the brink. What do we do? And so we were on calls until about 2.30 or 3 in the morning, like immediately right then. Um, the next day we go into work on Thursday, and um, it's just you're either in a meeting or it's water cooler talk. And everybody's just literally wandering around like zombies. What do we do? What do we do? Um, we kind of pieced the day together on Thursday. Friday, we let everybody know, go into the office, grab your things, try to be there for a half hour, but pack it up. And you got to, you got to, we were forced to have home offices at this point, traditionally with an, with an organization that was anti home office. So we, we took the brunt of it in a 24 hour span. Um, and I spent probably the next week just solely working with IT to yeah. pull out and to teach people, you know, the cloud and, oh, what is Microsoft Teams? Here's all you can do with it. I had experience with that because I come more from a technical background. So we're just scheduling and scheduling and here's how you use this. And then we're going to use Zoom and then Zoom had all the problems that they had. It's okay, we're going to stop using Zoom and now we're going to use this. And then to try to change the entire culture of an organization in a, in a 24 to 40 hour period was, it was an absolute challenge. It was, it was very, very hard. And now we're at the point where our, our employees don't want to go back. Now they love it so much. They're like, I'm still doing this forever other than game days. So that we've created a bit of a monster. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, you know, I'm sure I, I invite you guys to share your experiences in the breakout room because it's very, you know, everybody knows where they were when 9-11 happened. You know, I, I know I was, I was a, uh, getting blood work done and, and running to Walmart and the, the lady drawing my blood was like, Oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to get to Walmart. You know, like it was like chaos, like instantly hit like a big, like a big tsunami, I guess. <laughs> so thank you all for sharing that. And in your subgroups, please do share that with each other. Cause it's something we all remember. I'm sure. Well, now that we've been doing this for three, four months, um, there are definitely some positives that have come out of it and definitely some things we want to keep going as John mentioned at the top. So let's go around and, and from your each of the panelists perspectives, what are some of the opportunities that you see um, came out of this? What are some of the positive lessons that you learned from this process? So we'll go back around the horn back to Tooney. <laughs> yeah, we have learned so much and um, the, I, I always had on the shelf virtual programming, um, but I had no idea we'd be where we are now. I mean, I, I thought we'd get maybe half of the way, uh, half of to where we are now by like mid 2021. <laughs> and, yeah, 70 programs is huge. And you know, like last Thursday's Venture Cafe programming, we started it out, um, our first panel was all in Europe. So um, having access to, to so much more, uh, you know, knowledge capital people, humans that you wouldn't have access to prior to this has been, that's, that's been fantastic as far as programming. Um, we've added um, value for our sponsors, right? Because now we, um, we record like you're recording right now. We edit, we post to our YouTube. So these programs have become evergreen and assets to all that are um, part of it. And sure. we've created a, a fantastic podcast now um, that was again on the shelf, but didn't think we'd get to maybe till Q3. And um, it, you know, th those are a few of the, a few of the things um, that are takeaways. And then just for me personally, you know, I've never worked harder, but my quality of life has improved a bit because I'm not commuting as much. Um, I, I was already using public transit, so I you know would take the bus, and I loved that. For that half an hour, I could catch up on my emails before I walked in, and then I was fresh for my team, and then vice versa on the way home, so I could be caught up when I got off the bus or train and um, be fresh for my family. So, um, but working from home, like I, as a director, don't need to go into our physical space five days a week. Right. But that's Absolutely. a good way. And same with certain team members. You know, certain team members are going to need to go because that's part of their their job, but other team members are 
doing great at home and I want them to enjoy quality of life. So those are a few. Great, thank you very much, Jimmy. Uh, Carrie, what are some things well, you've learned? There's been many, uh, I'm always looking for the silver lining in everything, no matter what. Um, for me, it was a wake up call to make sure that if something happens like this again, which it probably will, that we have a crisis plan in place. Mm -hmm. So really thinking ahead, um, we were, we did pretty well with transitioning to working from home, but we weren't prepared financially or mentally. Right. Um, <clears throat> I just remember feeling like I was hit by a bus for about three weeks. Um, and just that shift and change. And, you know, I like routine and I like, I like to have control over everything and feeling out of control was a little bit scary. Um, <clears throat> you know, we're also questioning going through the budget and looking at every line item. And for the first time, like, really, like, do we really need this subscription? Do we need this? Do we need that? Um, and realize how much money we were just spending on things that we didn't really need. Um, and now we're looking at, you know, do we need a physical studio? Can we downsize? Can we do a co-sharing space? You know, we obviously can work from home. Um, the one thing I worked on, like moving to Rhode Island was to really separate work life and home life. So when I go home prior to COVID, I wouldn't work on anything. Uh, I would spend time with family. Weekends, I wouldn't work. And in New York, I was working 80 hours a week. So I really made an effort to separate it. So I don't, I don't know if I could work from home permanently. Um, so just thinking about that. But for the first time in years, it seems, we're actually focusing on our own positioning, our new website, new sales tools, and, and rethinking how we can help our clients. There's so many opportunities for using design to help solve other people's challenges in this, in this pandemic. Fantastic. Um, all right then, how about you, Denny? What are some things you guys have learned? Yeah, I think a couple of big things for us is, um, number one, kind of jokingly, but it is kind of serious, like seeing everybody through all the Zoom calls and everything and seeing their rooms and their backgrounds. I've learned a lot about our employees and like yeah. the makeup of their rooms and oh, this person likes to move around every day. So it, we've actually grown a lot closer in a lot of our conversations. Um, some of them were forced at the beginning, more of a scheduled type thing. And, but now they're, you know, just, just calling and checking in on people. You know, normally you would see them. And so we've gotten to, to learn more about our employees and their families and, and things like that, which has really helped connect us. Um, but I think the other two big things are number one are the opportunity for us to, again, change our mindset. Um, some of that traditional old school thinking of, you know, um, a lot of these roles, especially I'm not going to pick on salespeople. So if any of you are in sales, I'm not picking on you, but some of, you know, sales can be a very, you know, metrics driven role. And, you know, what have you done for me lately and how many calls and this and that. And so you, uh, we've had some leaders who might not be the most trustworthy. And so my conversations with them have been, is it, is that a you problem? What is the deal? And are we hiring the right people or not? Cause if we're hiring the right people, they should be able to, to make these calls from home sitting in that cube over there isn't going to be the make or break. And if it is, then, then we've got other issues. And so it's given us a lot of opportunity to have some really in-depth conversations about, um, about that makeup. And then the last thing, and, and this is an interesting one is, you know, we have our, our office at the arena and then we have uh, one offsite at a sports complex. And we're actually looking at building across from our arena. Uh, it's called the SED, the sports entertainment district. So a lot of cities have these where you've got, this whole outside venue, those who can't come to the game, they can go watch it there. And that's where we're going to move all of our offices and everything, et cetera, et cetera. This has made us literally rethink the office plans, how much space we need. And so we're defining what roles can be hybrid roles forever, what roles need to be there and what roles, quite frankly, could never come into the office again. And we would be fine like our data science team, et cetera. So we've got a lot of opportunity moving forward to a save a ton of money, but really to realign that model that we're looking at, which would hopefully attract more people and give us a lot more flexibility. Absolutely, Denny. Yeah, that's huge. I, I, I second the, uh, how much I've appreciated seeing a, a more casual look at everyone, you know, kind of, we're all more vulnerable, uh, all the talk show hosts. I mean, I love Jimmy Fallon's kids now and his dog and you know, I love that. And I, and I hope that we continue with kind of a more be yourself. Don't put up a veneer. You know, I hope that that is something that we gain from this. Um, 
So before we go on to our fourth question, which is about realignment strategies, I thought I'd throw it out to um, to everyone on the phone here. What what are some of the key lessons that you guys have picked up? I'd love to hear from from others. Feel free to take yourself off mute and feel free to turn on your videos. Those that don't have it on, it's all about connecting. <laughs> Anybody else have any big lessons or things that they appreciate that have come about because of this? I have one. And Thank I was you. just thinking about, um, as Denny was saying, that some roles will always be work from home. Um, our company actually invested in everybody's kind of work from home space. They gave us all a little bit of money to spend on furniture or since it was such a fast transition. Wow. Um, and I'm just thinking about like, you know, that was a great benefit for those of us who will probably continue to work from home for at least some portion of our job moving forward. But like larger corporations, um, is anybody thinking about that in terms of like, you know, working from home is a benefit in and of itself for many people, but in order to attract work from home people, have you thought about investing in their quality of life at their home? Great question. You know, I've been following this pretty closely because of what I do. And one of the things that I do think a lot of already very forward thinking companies do around that, especially companies where they're working distributed already. One of my favorite people to follow, by the way, is the guy who runs wordpress.com. Um, but, you know, they just think of it like they're like the budget they would spend on office. Let's give, let's split what we're saving with the employees or whatever, because if I've got a stand up desk and I've got a, you know, a, a treadmill and I'm way more productive because of it and I don't have to go to the office ever. So they don't have to spend that money. It's definitely Amy, something that a lot of the most progressive companies are already essentially building in. I'm part of the um, central Florida economic council here. Um, and I know a lot of the businesses that that we meet with, they they some of them have already done it. Some of them are now doing it. They're 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 doing that that financial allotment. Everybody's paycheck gets uh, whatever or monthly stipend of you know two hundred dollars for whatever you can say for internet or whatever or you know paper printing and cartridges and whatever. But there's just, there's different allotments based on roles based on whatever that they they just have now started to feed into their you know into their paychecks. And I think that's I think that's a great thing. Um, yeah. And I know, we, you know, a lot of companies, we, Orlando isn't a big um, public transportation mecca at all. Um, but I know some other companies I've worked for in the past, they've, based on different things that have happened, they've had to shift what they're offering their employees to, you know, to take public transportation. And obviously, I think now we're doing the kind of the off, opposite switch, right? When we do go back to the office, more people will be driving. So I don't know what that looks like here. I know we've got a train that kind of runs one, it goes back and forth. You have to live within a certain amount of, of distance to have it accessible, but the train was getting very popular finally. And now everybody's like anti-train, what do we do? And now you're going to have some frustrations with when we do get back to work, whatever that looks like, 50%, 700%, you know, our roadways, which are empty now, they're going to, they're going to spike back up again. And so again, what do we do to incentivize those to work from home or to get them to the office back without wanting to walk in ready to, you know, have road rage? Absolutely. <laughs> um, here's a question that popped in in the chat from Tino. Thank you. Um, how have you adapted your leadership style based on the new reality of uh, where we are? Uh, I can take that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't know. Have I adapted guys? My, most of my team is, I think all of my team is on here right now. I think, <laughs> I think that I'm leading in the same way. It's just, um, it's, uh, I don't know how we've been leading except for, I, I really love what I was going to add to that, um, is Dan and I have been able and, and, um, our Cambridge team, we've been able to um, get, have our teams get to know each other better and therefore we're starting to work together more. Um, that's been really exciting. Uh, thinking about um, strengths on each of our teams and how we can kind of cross pollinate and um, work on programming together and whatnot. I think um, for me, it's just enhanced my leadership style. Um, we've been able to kind of move, and Lisa knows me well, 
um, faster in the forward direction that I've always wanted to move in. I'm very collaborative by nature and our ecosystem partners, which I put in the chat, um, that's been a great bonus. So I think being able to empower individual team members um, more quicker has been a good lesson for me in leadership and, and being more reflective because things are moving so quickly, if anything. But I would say my leadership style has kind of stayed the same. Great. Anyone else? I, I would echo Tony. I think I went through a, a training years ago called Leader Point. It was when I was at EA Sports. If anybody's ever heard of it, been part of it. It was like a five-day submersive um and like you it was amazing and it really changed my my view of, of leadership and i think very similar to me i've always been very much on the empower side like i'm going to let you make decisions i'm not going to let you do anything as a direct report that's gonna you know get you in trouble enough to to have your your employment terminated but i'm gonna i'm gonna guide you and lead you and i'm here to help you as much as possible but i'm gonna let you make the call and sometimes you're gonna trip and fall and that's okay but i'll pick you up and we'll pick each other up but I'm not going to be here to tell you every single thing. You've got to get better and grow. And so I think I've always been like that ever since I took that training and it changed my philosophy. And this has just really helped me with my conversations. I think if anything, I've just made, I've had to dedicate more time to do more of the the one-on-one -on -one calls and, and touch points because I always do that. We have regularly scheduled touch base and I let my, my, my team tell me when they want and how, and how long I, that's their cadence for their touch base meeting for me or one-on-ones. But now I'm finding myself, I need to call them more to check in to see how they are doing. Um, because the, the water cooler, the walk by, hey, how you doing? Oh, you don't, you look like you're frustrated. I don't have that now because I right. can't see them 24. So I've got to be able to make sure there's more, more outreach by me. Right. Yeah, part no. of, um, like, we've been working the same way. Um, but I realize how important it is to be more, like, more open and transparent. Like, you are going to be okay. Your job is secure. And I think there was a lot of concern with letting one person go like, Oh my God, am I going to be next? So I've been trying to like boost morale and we'll have, you know, these group zoom sessions where we just talk about random things and just try to gauge how everyone's feeling. And if we get a new job, we like celebrate. It's very exciting. Um, so it's just trying to boost morale when we're not together. It's been a big, focus for us. Uh, absolutely. Um, also some, some good comments in here. Meredith, say more about uh, the new layer and focus of leadership. Yeah, I mean, as, as leaders, it, it's not that we shouldn't always be conscious and aware about how people are feeling, but I think we can all agree, similar to those who were you know, in the business environment during 9-11, this is a whole different level of feeling. Um, and even feelings that people don't even know they have. And, 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 and this, unlike anything I know I've gone through, this, no one is not affected by this in some way, shape, or form. You know, this isn't geographic or specific. This is truly global. Um, and, and just always being consciously aware of that, of, you know, even if somebody says they're fine, having to now listen that much more carefully because it's sometimes harder to see in the distance of a video of what are they really fine um and figuring how to kind of take that kind of offline out of the zoom world to have a one-on-one -on -one call um to give people safe haven to say i'm struggling be it i've got young kids and you know juggling with all the school stuff or i've got you know illness in my family or i'm just generally just terrified about going back outside you know, because I think that's the new yeah, layer yeah. of what's going on is companies are reopening and there is this underlying, um, I don't care what the CDC or whatever says, I'm scared to go back. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's, that's great. Um, all, all very powerful comments there. Um, so I love Tooney to here. Uh, my team has grown so much both individually and as a team. Absolutely. I think we all have. I think we've, we've grown vulnerable and, and, and gracious and appreciative um, in many, many different ways. Uh, before we go to our breakout rooms, let's just do one last quick question. You want to share with us all um, some of your realignment strategies. So, Denny, I know that you are kind of leading the charge on the protocol for coming back to in-office work. Can we start with you, maybe? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so, 
we've put together a, I think right now it's 14 pages. I'd like it to be less, but there's a lot of detail, basically a playbook. And it's everything from, you know, we're going to have temperature screening, at, you know, at our lobby before you come in, answer these five questions, um, you know, what the acceptable answers are. I'm working with our leadership team um, in regards to the CAD drawings. And when we come back, we're right now, and it's a moving target. So another thing, if you put it in stone, you're going to fail. It needs to be a moving target. Um, we're looking at September or so for, and when we come back, it'll be 50%. And so we're aligning our teams to say, okay, every, every leader, every manager, if here's your layout, you know, if this person's working here, nobody can be within, you know, X amount of feet from them. So here's your layout. We're going to put one team on team blue and team white team blue will work Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday for the other team. And so trying to split up, you know, split up 50% occupancy. Um, wow. the big, the big push for us strategy wise was, Again, defining the roles that that just have to be in the arena during a game. And even though we're playing at Disney, our broadcast technology, they have to be at the arena. So what does that look like? And then having the philosophy that just because we're open and we can come back to 50%, if you're not comfortable, that's okay. Like we're not forcing anybody to come back into the office and, and that needs to be okay. Um, if you want to come back every day, that's also not okay either because we need to follow these, these protocols the CDC has set and what we have set. And so we've got an entire playbook of just different strategies on occupancy, safety, cleaning, um, wearing a mask in all common areas, cutting our conference rooms from capacities down to very minuscule. The social distancing part is a huge, huge piece for us. And we're very focused on that. Wearing masks when you're talking with somebody and trying to get it pushed where we're not just sitting at our desk with them because that's miserable. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, that'll probably be our CEO's, our, uh, his call, but, um, a lot of strategic things coming down the pipe. Yeah. So, uh, in talking to one of your colleagues, Denny, what do you do if the person sitting next to you, even, you know, two desks away, uh, starts coughing? Yeah. That's the big debate. Like, okay, who's, who's going to run to the, the police and is the HR, the police, which I don't want to be, I don't want us to be the police. Like we're already in HR. Like it is what it is, right? Like, come on. Um, so I think that's where we need to have that discussion and it's about training, right? It's about having our, our learning and development manager. We're building out trainings before we go back to the office and that's going to be its own topic. You know, is it, is it allergies? Do you have allergies? What, like, how do we, how do we let your coworkers guys, I, I have the sniffles, whatever, it's not COVID or whatever. Uh, we've still got to build that out, but it's, that's going to be a big issue. I mean, I've been places where I've seen somebody cough and my first thought was, oh my gosh, like what, what does that mean? You know, I'm going to be the one to cough. I'm trying to get a uh, Somebody that just joined, we're getting some feedback. So if you'd put yourself on mute, could be Jamie, could be. Um, Great. Yeah, Daddy, I, that's, that's a c continual conversation of uh, how comfortable. When I take my mask off, I, I usually cough because I've felt so stifled that my body wants to cough and my whole family's like, stop, mom! <laughs> don't <laughs> cough. <laughs> exactly. Uh, what about you, Carrie? What um, are some of your re realignments? Uh, so at this point, so we are um, one year into a five-year lease. So... For now, we're keeping the office, um, and we're going to see how it goes through the end of the summer. I kind of want to downsize a little bit. Not that we have a huge space now, but I think we can lower the price and get a smaller space. Um, I started back at the office last week. I'm all by myself. I needed to separate myself from home um, for a while there, starting to feel a little more normal. Um, so, But everyone else is working from home, and they'll continue to work from home through the summer. And we decided just to stay fluid and see how everyone feels. We're all on the same page about, you know, we're all paranoid of getting sick. Um, and so we decided, you know, when the time is right, we will probably shift to a hybrid model and only get together in person when we have to do that in, you know, creative thinking, brainstorming, workshoppy type activities to kick off projects and things like that. And then to actually do the work, I realized like, most of the time, we're just all sitting in front of our computers with our heads down, just getting stuff done. And so we can do that stuff at home. Um, and obviously, we won't be traveling anytime soon. I'm not sure how it's going to go. We do a lot of exhibition design. So I have an exhibition coming up with David Webb, which hopefully will be pushed back to the beginning of next year. 
but I keep thinking like if they still want to have this in the fall, how am I go? Am I going to go to New York and install this thing? And are people actually going to come to this? Um, so I think for now, you know, traveling's pretty much on hold and all of our clients are on board with video conferencing. So that's not a person problem at all. Um, our landlord is insane when it comes to the signage. He has signage pasted everywhere. Um, about social distancing. I, I wear a mask when I run to the bathroom. It's pretty, pretty locked down. Um, so we'll continue if, if people do come back at the end of the summer, we'll continue following those rules. Um, and, you know, because we're a small firm, we're very communicative about our concerns. We uh, started a Google Doc and at any point anybody can go in and put any thoughts or ideas for how we can, you know, move forward with clients or the space um, so it's it's just very fluid you know everything it's, things are changing so quickly you know there could be a time where we have to lock down again and then we have to shift back hopefully not but we might have to shift back to how we were working before so we're just kind of staying open-minded about it um, and focusing now on helping our clients get through this yep good client perspective and agile is is kind of mm -hmm. what's needed here yeah Tooney, any changes for you guys in the restart many many changes um, <laughs> we as I mentioned before have been very busy through all of this and continuing so our mission is to provide the spaces in person or virtual now and programming so anyone with an idea or business can can come connect to resources that will help them grow and we've been able to fulfill our mission so well during this that we're not you know we're still very busy in the virtual space but we also need to open up our physical space. And you know, that, that's been difficult, um, making those decisions. And fortunately, we have our colleagues at District Hall Boston, and we've been working you know, in lockstep, um, deciding what the future of our spaces look like. So tomorrow, um, you know, we need to provide the space for those who need it. Like Carrie, you know, some, some people, um, you know, have offices, but maybe they're not big enough to offer enough space for a team to come together, but a team needs to come together. So we, we are, at least for July and August, opening up our space at greatly reduced rates for our meeting rooms and event space. So tomorrow, uh, we have a group coming in. We're allowing up to 15 um, to come into our space, and we have the event space. So instead of before, we have our two large meeting rooms we could have used for that and that would have been a lot less cost prohibitive for a company. Now we're pivoting and we're moving them into our large event space, but at a greatly reduced rate because that's our, you know, that's, that's what we're here to provide. Um, so just trying to, to play our role for the community. We have a lot of independent workers, whether they're sole openers or they work for a larger company, but out of their house that, you know, their, maybe their home offices aren't conducive to them um, and they're waiting for us to open the public lounges. So we're opening our first floor public lounge and then on the second floor, the private meeting rooms and event space we will utilize if anyone needs it. It's not like a ton of people. Um, people have been gracious and keep postponing and pushing out their um, programs or events. But there are some organizations like Tomorrow that they really need a space. So, um, yeah. so, yeah. so we, you know, we've, transition we pivoted our revenue model um I mentioned before the programming and the podcast so we're very thoughtful about continuing to offer that and we'll see how it goes yeah. <laughs> we're, we're opening our physical space we were going to open it monday but we decided we're not quite ready yet we still want to iron some stuff out so we've decided to open it a week from monday the 13th great well, you know, you have to wonder, are you ever going to get those uh, increased prices back or the, you know, your discounted rates, you know, are here now because of the situation. Um, just like at my old company, everybody got a across the board 10% pay cut. You have to wonder, is that ever going to come back? You know, <laughs> so these are a lot of questions that I have in terms of, yeah, go ahead. Tuni. So we, um, what I'm looking at, like, I like to look at kind of the end goal and reverse engineer yep. everything to that. So I'm picturing what does a 500 or more person event look like at District Hall Providence, but maybe only 50 or 75 people tops in person. So we're creating hybrid offerings for our physical spaces now. Great, good. All right, well, we have um, only a couple of minutes left for general Q&A, and then we want to get us into our three breakout rooms. So does anybody have a general Q&A question that would serve the, the group? 
If not, it's okay. We can go to our breakout rooms. Um, great. Uh, thank you for sharing. Meredith shared a, a note about uh, an event on LinkedIn on um, from Dr. Fauci. Who? So, all right, so if we don't have any specifics for the group at large, we'll go ahead and go into our three breakout groups. Again, you all signed up with the uh, breakouts that you were most interested in, and uh, my colleague Grant Graves will be, okay, we're going. <laughs> okay, there we go. Going back to the corporate office, Grant will be um, leading that group. Uh, Tooney will be, um, uh, I'm sorry, Tuni will be number three challenges of solo entrepreneurs. I'll go with that. And um, um, Tino will go with transitioning team to remote working. So with that said, let's go to our breakout rooms and enjoy. Turn on your videos. It's all about connecting.